it's all talking about God knowing your name and knowing who you are God actually does know who you are Psalm 139 verses 1 through 6 it says he knows me everything about me it's too wonderful for me to even totally comprehend it's too much for me to know God knows who you are God knows what you have need of Matthew 6 30, your heavenly father knows the things that you have need of says it plainly Jesus talking God is watching over us he knows what we are facing he knows we're never alone he knows how to take care of the grass and the flowers and the birds of the sky he also knows how to take care of his children if God knows how to take care of the whole rest of the world don't you believe God knows how to take care of you Matthew 6 14 don't even worry about tomorrow you take care of that when it gets here today you will have challenges enough to face and you take them one by one because you know God is with you in 2nd Corinthians 12 9 he says my grace is sufficient for you it's all that you need you don't need any more than that it's sufficient it covers everything for my strength is made perfect in weakness it also says let the weak say I am strong and let the poor say I am rich why don't you right now if you're weak raise your hand and say I'm strong if you're poor raise your hand and say I'm rich I'll get out of town hallelujah God knows your potential God in first John 1 through 9 he talks about God is faithful and he is just he will never let anything happen to you that he does not know about in advance and yet we have Christians who are troubled all the time wondering what's going to happen to them in their life God even tells us in Psalm 37 verse 23 that the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord God knows you're going in you're coming out he knows you're rising up you're laying down God knows everything about you he knows what's getting ready to happen in your life he even knows you so well he knows the decisions that you're going to make before you make them hallelujah and Christians are preordained predestined we're predestined of God in other words God has a plan for you God knows what he's going to do with your life all you have to do is yield to him all you have to do is obey God he knows uh, the word of God says he bottles our tears <laughs> he keeps all your tears you don't even do that amen you try well, go get a Kleenex and, and you wipe them off and throw it away but God bottles your tears he knows what they are he knows the numbers of hair on your head he knows how many he started out with on my head and he knows how many is there this morning hallelujah <laughs> he writes down in a book of remembrance those of us who love and fear the Lord how is God going to forget about you many people in the Bible God called them directly by name they didn't know God was watching them but God called them directly by name my favorite is Hagar uh, because of the expression that she had she was kicked out of her only home she was a slave girl they bought her for a slave who did that Abraham and Sarah they bought her for a slave and then they came up with the idea well we I'm, I'm too old to have a child so let's give Hagar to Abraham my husband so that he can have a child with her sounds like a page out of the newspapers today and so he had a child by her and of course you know uh, Sarah couldn't handle that she thought she could but she thought Hagar was acting too uppity and walking around because she had a baby and she couldn't have any she was too old and here what happened was he she drove her out of the camp now here she is with a child and no place to go and don't know nobody and don't know what to do does that sound like stories we hear today of people that uh, 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 women who get driven out and have nobody to turn to many of them in our day and time turn to all kinds of things crime uh, prostitution drugs all kinds of stuff they have a child and we tried to alleviate that 
the government did churches did by trying to take care of the child but now they got too many rules now if you're pregnant and you ain't got no way of support the first thing they want you to do is to abort the child listen uh, hey, you didn't give it to you God gave it to you uh, you need to be careful about what you do on things like this but God when she was out there and she was faint and the little boy was about to die all of a sudden the angel of the Lord came to her and told her Hagar listen Hagar don't be afraid I'm going to take care of that little boy and I'm going to make him a great nation you know what her response was this is what's beautiful now she said thou God seest me you have you've paid attention to me you know that I'm here I, thou God you see me how many times has God walked up to somebody he called Abraham out of the by his name out of Ur of the Chaldees out of Babylon and brought him in and said if you'll follow me I'll show you a land that nobody can claim but you it's going to be your land everywhere you put your foot I'm going to give it unto you he called Moses by name Moses take the shoes off your feet Moses I'm going to send you down to deliver all of my people out of Egypt land he knew Moses by his name and he had a plan for Moses look at little Samuel we I always love the story of little Samuel from Sunday school because Samuel uh, uh, he was a, a child of a woman's old age uh, we thought and uh, she prayed and, and, and the, the, the high priest got mad at her because she was sitting on the altar and her lips were moving but no voice came out and so the man of God uh, the high priest said are, are you uh, are you drunk with wine what's wrong with you you should put away wine and she said no Lord I am just pouring my heart out to God you know sometimes you can get in a place where you want God to answer you uh, it, the only thing she wanted was a child and she made a vow to God if you give me the child a man child I'm going to give him back to you so that he may serve you. And now here you are uh, years later when he's about six or seven years old. He's in the house of Eli, uh, uh, the high priest. And uh, in the middle of the night, God spoke to Samuel. He called his name Samuel. He's a little boy. And so he jumped out of bed and ran in there and said, yes, Eli, I am here. And he said, I didn't call you go back to bed you were having a dream and so he went back and God called him again Samuel and he woke up again and he ran back in and said here am I I'm here to uh, what do you want and uh, he said I didn't call you he said next time you see it took two or three times but even Eli knew this was God speaking to Samuel he said next time don't come running to me instead say Lord here am I because God has something he wants to tell you listen child of God God knew Samuel's name and he raised him up to be a great prophet God knew Gideon uh, uh, you know you, we, we talk about persecution on the church nowadays and persecution on God's people when Gideon was alive the Philistines now called Palestinians I guess but the Philistines were in charge of the country at where the Jews the children of Israel lived, the Jews and also Israel Gideon was of Israel he wasn't a Jew he wasn't from the tribe of Judah and Benjamin uh, that are now called everybody's called Jews if you got any uh, descendancy from Abraham but Israel was a separate country and they were under bondage every and he was threshing on a, a, a threshing floor up behind two little hills where nobody could see him doing this because if they knew he had a crop they were going to take it away from him and all of a sudden God found Gideon thrashing on his thrashing floor hidden from everybody so the Philistines would not steal his grain that he had worked for and uh, they came up to him uh, an angel of the Lord came to him and said Gideon thou mighty man of valor and I can just hear him say who me you talking to me uh, mighty man of valor that can't be me uh, uh, I'm, I'm hiding here from my enemies he said no I'm going to raise you up and you're going to deliver God's people out from under the ha hand uh, of these people that have oppressed you 
And so God did. In other words, his biggest shock that he had to get over was that God knew his name. And that angel of the Lord came to him to talk to him. God has had many others throughout the Bible. Hallelujah. Uh, I knew what my name was going to be uh, when I was still, before I was born. My mom already knew. You know why? A man by the name of Jim Bolin, who was descendant from Ann Bolin, that, that family was in Kentucky, and he was a little uh, short guy, and he had red hair, and he came up to my mother when she was laying there dying. Uh, on, uh, she was laying on a little pallet on the front porch, and he walked up to her, and he said, Ruthie, I, I'm going to come and pray for you because your son is going to be a prophet that I am going to anoint, talking about me. And he told her, you'll call him Ross. Whatever plan you were talking about, well, you know, everybody wanted to name me when I was born. Uh, my grandmother went in there and named me, and they had, uh, then they had to cross that out when my grandfather went there, and they crossed that one out. You ought to see my birth certificate. It's got all kinds of names written on there. It's a, it, it, and the date's wrong. I don't even know if I was born on the date that they said because I was born up in the hills and in the hollers. And somebody finally went down and got a birth certificate. Well, you know, <laughs> you want to know my name? I'll, I'll give them all to you. Agigaje, Troy, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> call me Jim, amen. Uh, call me Anthony. You can call me several names. They scratched them all out. Uh, and, and the final one, when my mom got there, said, no, his name has to be Ross. Write that on there. And uh, why? It's because the prophecy came to her because when he prophesied to her and told her that I was going to be born a prophet and you'll call his name Ross, I don't know why. I, I mean, it doesn't have a ring to it, you know. <laughs> if she had called me Ross Angeles or something, you know, <laughs> or, or calling me something famous, I don't know. But uh, you, you never know what God has in mind. Amen. Ross may some, one day be a famous name. I don't know. It's not now. But uh, uh, anyway, she changed my name to Ross on my birth certificate. The thing I'm trying to say to you is this very plainly. God knows your name. He knows what he wants you to do. He knows what he's going to make out of you. He's written your name down in a book. He's not going to let the devil overtake you. He's not going to let you be destroyed. God knows your name. God knows his plans that he has for you. Have you read that scripture in the Bible? Jeremiah 29 verse 11. I know the, th uh, the thoughts that I think towards you. I think thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you an, uh, an expected end. God has plans for our lives, not to destroy us, but to bless our lives with good things. That's God's plan for you. Don't, let, don't get out of God's plan. God's plan is to raise you up and bless you in everything you set your hand to do. Every good thing that the Bible talks about should be a promise that you're planning to claim. God wants to do it for you. God wants to bless you with it. God wants to anoint you with it. In other words, we're given names when we're born, aren't we? I told you about my name, but we also not, don't have just a first name. We have a surname, and uh, it's a specific family name. That means you're of this family, and uh, so it's important that you have a name. And uh, uh, many people are not happy with the names that they were given, so for, you know, for 50 to 100 bucks, you can go down and name yourself whatever name you want. And they'll register it in the books and, and give you, assign you a number of your name change so that they don't refer to you by that name anymore, but now they have a number for you. Isn't that just like mankind? They don't want to know you by your name. They want to give you a number. Everyone likes to be known by their name, though. Someone knows their name, and, and they, they think if they know my name, they know me. But we know, don't we, that if somebody knows your name, it doesn't mean they know anything about you. And if you know somebody's name, it doesn't mean you know anything about them. You know, uh, I, I knew Gene Autry's name, but when I saw him, he didn't know me. I was really disappointed about that. <laughs> Hi, Gene. And he just walked right on by like he didn't even know me. Amen. He didn't know my name. I knew his name. It shows, listen, if, if somebody knows your name, it shows a form of intimacy that you know each other. It's a friendly thing. Man, kind, businesses, the government we have don't want to go by your name. 
Instead, they want to give you a number because it's easier to kill a number than it is to kill a name. It's easy to do away with people if all that you see is a list of numbers on a page. But if each one of them has a name, that's something totally different. They want to dehumanize us by giving us a number and taking away our name. Uh, we, we, uh, when, uh, you know, we become numbers to certain people. Uh, the, the reason I don't do ba uh, bi banking business with Christian Credit Union across the street is because they didn't want to listen to my name they only wanted to look at the numbers that were involved. Are you listening to me? I don't like to be referred to as a number. Amen. I mean, unless you're going to call me numero uno. Amen. You can call me number one if you want to. Hallelujah. But even that's got a bad term to it nowadays. God, they don't want to give you a name. They don't want to listen to your name. Everybody wants to dehumanize you and give you just a number. Uh, it's in, impersonal. And, and it's an unwillingness on their part to actually know who you are. They would rather refer to you by your number. Well, what is your social security number? What is your Michigan ID number? What is your driver's license number? In other words, every time they want to talk to you, if it's anything legal, they only want to know a number. What is your passport number? What is your green card number? Uh, you have to give me that information so we'll know it's you. I said, well, I'm Ross Collette. Well, that don't mean nothing. What is your Social Security number? And when I give them my Social Security number, I can make up one. And they'll say, oh, well, we wrote that down. That's good. We have that information now. It does, see, all they wanted is the number. They don't want to know who you are. Uh, most of the time, people who get to know you, sometimes if they want to know you better, they'll ask your name uh, instead of a number. But many people are still in business and, and in banking and in, in government, they only want to refer to you as a number. So if they knock you off somewhere along the line, all you are is a number and a statistic. They don't want to list the names of people that are shot dead in Detroit or Chicago or in Philadelphia or in New York. They don't want to say the names. They don't want to say the names of the shooters. Hallelujah. Instead, well, 19 people were killed over the weekend in Chicago. Well, what's their name? Who are they? Well, they don't want to say that. They just want to say 19 were. 16 were shot down here in this school and 22 were shot out there in that school. What's their names? You know, uh, you, you can't imagine uh, the battle it was to get that wall built in Washington, D.C. with the names of the Vietnam people that were murdered. They didn't want anybody to see how many people were actually killed in the war in the Vietnam War. They don't want to do that now with the, uh, the ongoing war that we're still in, whether you know it or not. We're still fighting the same war when we invaded from, uh, uh, Kuwait. Uh, we're still fighting that same war from the time Bush 41 was the president. We're still fighting the same war. How many people have died? How many people have lost their limbs and their eyes? and their le Well, they've got numbers for that. And if you say, well, 50, a lot, well, what's their names? You can go to Washington, D.C., and you can read the name of everybody on that Vietnam Wall, every one of them who died. Somebody would like to send back and say, well, 53,000 or so were killed. Yes, but what was their name? Nobody wants to know that. They just want to know how many, how much time, how much money is it going to cost. They put a dollar sign, a number on everything. How much does it cost? That's one thing about automobiles I found out. All people want to know is how much the monthly payment are. Amen. Uh, how much the payments are. Uh, that's a, they don't want to find out the end figure. They don't want to find out some numbers. Uh, people are conscious about how old they are. Well, how old are you? Well, you know, nobody wants to tell their age. Well, they want to know your age so they can put you in a category. Amen. That's all it is. Uh, I, I got Humana Insurance. They're trying their best to get some nurse to come out here and look through my house. Are they crazy? 
I said, well, send me, uh, give me their driver's license number. Give me that nurse's social security number. Give me that, uh, get, I want their information. Uh, what were you going to do with the information? I said, I'm going to get a police report on them. I said, what, I'm going to open my house and let some crook come in here and look around? I, well, they'll be in there counting the silverware instead of checking my blood pressure. Come on, say amen. Huh? And it's all about numbers. Well, what is your number? What is your number on everything you have? They tell you to keep a list of the numbers that are important in business. They want you to keep a list. Don't forget your Social Security number. I had to memorize my selective service number. I was about to be drafted. I had to remember that. When I walked in there to be examined, they never asked my name. They said, what's your number? You hand me the paper with the number on it. I said, don't you want to know who I am? No, it's not important. We got to have that number. I said, well, what if I traded numbers with somebody? Oh, well, we'd find out eventually. Well, why don't you find out right now? Amen. <laughs> it ain't going to take that much time to find out who I am, but they didn't really care who I am because they said that they had to have 399 people uh, drafted in southern Arizona and they didn't care what their names were. They didn't care what color they were. They didn't care the education they had. All they knew was a number. They had to get and fulfill the number. That was it. You're controlled by numbers. There's no personal relationship with numbers. Uh, uh, number 41, come over here. <laughs> well, who, who's that? Am I 41? Let me look that up. Uh, people want numbers to identify people. That's no good. There's no personal relationship, and there is no effort. Once you get put a number on you, there is no uh, effort to get to know you better. When you get a Social Security number, they don't want to know anything about you except your age. Well, they know your age because they got your Social Security number. Uh, well, when you go into the hospital, give them your Social Security number. They have to be able to identify you. They don't want anybody to say, hey, I'm Ross, here I am. You know, uh, the number, that ain't me. The number is something that somebody assigned to me. Are you getting what I'm trying to say? Many people want to control you by numbers today. But I here, here's the good part. Jesus knows your name. And he's got your number. Come on, say amen. Jesus knows who you are. He knows how to make a difference in your life. He knows you're rising up and you're laying down. He knows the desires on the inside of you because basically it's God who puts the desires in your heart. He said, uh, he said I will give you the desires of your heart. What you desire for, Psalm 34, 7, what you desire, I'm going to give you that desire. I'm going to put it in you. I'm going to control this part of your life. And if you'll listen to me, I'm going to work it out better. I'm going to do more for you than you would have even done for yourself. I will work it out better for you than you could even ask or think. Isn't it about time, church, that we start turning our life over to God? Isn't it time that we stop trying to do everything that we want to by the numbers? You know, a, a man's going to be arrested soon <laughs> and maybe uh, uh, thrown in jail because he said, I want to do everything by the numbers as I'm breaking the law. Well, what's going to happen to him? I don't want to do it that way. I want to do it by the scriptures. I want to do it by the word. I want to do it by the moving of the Holy Ghost. I want God to move in me. I want God to know my name. I want God to know your name. And believe me, he does right now. He knows who you are. He knows you're rising up. He knows you're laying down. And he knows what he has in plan, a uh, store for you. He knows what he's getting ready to do in your life. This brings me to a, another timely subject. Stop worrying about the future. Stop worrying. Stop listening to these goofball end of time revelators that don't have any scripture. All they have is their theories. Listen to me. God is not going to leave you alone. What if the Antichrist gets here? Who cares? God is not going to leave you alone. 
What if uh, you can't buy or sell without the mark of the beast? Who cares? God is going to feed you. God is going to take care of you. God saved you for a reason. God brought you forth this far for a reason. He knows you're rising up. He knows what he has planned for you. And now God's going to starve you to death. Listen, there's a big difference between God's people and the world. There's a big difference between God's people and the rest of the world. You're either one of us or you're one of them. Can anybody see that? God said all of these things are going to come upon the world. Well, that don't include me. I'm of the family of God. I have been born again. The Spirit of God lives on the inside of me. Well, what if some people don't believe? It doesn't make the faith of God of none effect. Instead, we believe. We believe God. We believe God will not only protect us and save us but he'll put food on our table he'll put a roof over our head he'll put clothes on our children's backs he'll give us the education that we need to serve him God will open doors for you hallelujah do you understand how much God has invested in you he loves you he saved you he called you forth while you were yet in sin like Abraham was in the land of the Babylonians God called him out now God is calling you out of this world he doesn't want you to walk like the world walks he doesn't want you to think what they think and do what they do listen somebody said oh have, have you listened to Iron Maiden he was telling me this and I said well I've seen the name well what about Ozzy Osbourne I, Black Sabbath yes I've seen the names Hallelujah. Well, did you know they're taking Roseanne off TV? I said, well, I saw that, but I got news for you. I didn't see the old Roseanne, and I didn't see the new Roseanne. So Roseanne being on TV means absolutely nothing to me. Hello? And what if some comedian gets on there and has a potty mouth? Is that going to upset me? You think I haven't heard people cuss before? Hello, who are you? Huh? You haven't heard somebody call people bad names before? How is this effect? It didn't affect you up until now. Come on, say amen. I'm not getting excited about all of this going on in that idiot town called Washington, D.C. Because you go up there and lose your mind. Amen. They all go crazy when they get there. They all talk to the reporters. The reporters talk to them, and they create their own little sub subterfuge. It means nothing. Listen, all they want to do is keep you as poor as they can, as long as they can. They don't want you to have anything. If you started out poor in this country, the whole system is set up to keep you poor. That's it, period. They don't want you to get up and getting anything and going anywhere. And they've sold us a bunch of lies. Uh, you know, well, keep your credit report good. Those numbers on your, your credit report number it has to be above a certain level or we're going to charge you more interest. Do you know something? They don't want your, your, your level up high. They want your level down low so they can charge you more. Hello? Don't think that man's sitting there lending money. He, he's a Pharaoh. Come on, say amen. He's ruling over us those credit card pharaohs. The only thing that's going to break you free from this cycle, listen to me, if the only thing that's going to break you free from this cycle is the anointing of God that comes on your life. And then we say, hallelujah, though I was rich, Jesus was rich, now for our sakes he became poor so that through his poverty he might make us rich. And it's not just talking about in the sweet by and by when you die one of these old days. It's talking about right now God can heal you right now God can save you right now God can bless you right now God can move you out of a dump and move you away from brother rat and sister roach and move you into the nicest part of town God can do that for you and you say how in the world would God do that God's not got money that you've never seen before. God has wealth that this world has not discovered before. God has things that he hasn't even shared with anybody yet. You want to know why? 
He's saving it for the last day to give it to his people. A new revelation from God is coming. God is going to lift you up and make you the head and not the tail. He's going to make you the first and not the last. He's going to make us the greatest and not the least. All nations of the world shall call us blessed because we are the children of the Most High God. Well, they're not doing it now, but Isaiah's prophecy is going to come to pass. They're going to call God's people blessed. I'll tell you why. When they run out of medicine, God hasn't got run out of healing power. Come on, say amen. When they run out of money, God hasn't run out of wealth. When they run out, the world runs out of oil. Who's going to put light in your house? They run out of coal. Who's going to put heat in your house? You think they're going to do you a favor because you've been a loyal customer for 50 years? They don't care if you freeze to death. Pay the bill or shut up. Amen. Uh, uh, or, uh, or let the house freeze to death. I'm telling you right now, you and I need to get on the right page with God. God is a blessing God. God is an anointing God. No other help I know. Father, I stretch my hand to thee. No other help I know. If thou withdraw thyself from me, tell me whither shall I go. God is on our side. God wants you to seek him now in this day and time. And listen, it's relatively easy now to serve God and seek God. It's relative. You know what? I could fill this church in a short while. All I'd have to do is compromise on the word of God. All I'd have to do is give up just a little bit. All I'd have to get up is get a, a, a little prissy uh, guy r dancing across the stage and playing that kind of music that they all like. I don't like no girly men in my church. I'm sorry. I, I don't care how talented they are. I just don't want that around me. Amen. You want it around you? I can point to 10 churches within 20 miles of right here where that's what they have. Instead, child of God, I'm going to stick with the word of God. I'm not going to preach any pleasing doctrines. I'm not going to preach things that make everybody happy and make everybody think it's going to be well and, and you don't have to worry. And you don't have to worry about things getting bad because Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night and take us out of here. They don't even have any scripture for what they're talking about. But it doesn't matter if they don't have scripture. That, that doesn't matter. They got the story that they're telling. I'm going to tell you, if God comes in here and takes people out of here, he's going to take the weak, not the strong. He's going to take those that don't have the Holy Ghost and leave us down here that have the Holy Ghost. I don't know about you. I'm a warrior for God. I'm ready to fight the devil no matter where he stands up. I'm ready to stand up for God. Are you? Hallelujah. Uh, he is, I have been given power and authority in the name of Jesus. I shall tread upon serpents. I shall tread upon uh, uh, the evil dragon of the devil. You will too. You want to know why? You have God living on the inside of you. You have God life in you. And greater Oh, come on here, church. You know this scripture from 1 John, the th uh, second cha fourth chapter. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Well, do you have any evidence of that, Brother Ross? Yeah, I've been shot at. They missed every time. I had a little lady in my church, sweetest little lady. I'm, I've told this more than once. I just love to hear the story. And ain't nobody else telling it, so I'll tell it myself. This lady in my church, she was a sweetheart. You know, I, I came down here and I, <laughs> I vacuumed the church last night myself. If it ain't done right, don't complain. I vacuumed you know, the church and I, I thought, well, this is basically where I started at. <laughs> I was cleaning the church and the first church I joined, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I went down there and uh, I saw it dirty, so I started cleaning it up. This lady was the same way. She came to church, and she would, she would have a little kit. She would chip off chewing gum that people threw on my hardwood floors. And so she'd chip it off. She had to spray. She'd spray it on there. It'd dissolve, and she'd chip it off. She had another thing. She'd spray on there, and it'd freeze it. It'd freeze the chewing gum, and then she'd chip it off. Then she'd get out her little kit, and she'd wipe it off real good and, and pledge it and everything, you know, put it made it on the floor now somebody threw paper down she'd pick it up she'd stand out in front of my building on broad street in philadelphia where everybody i'm sorry <laughs> 
everybody throws trash on the street there. And uh, they write tickets for them. They don't pay them, so they don't care. If they got trash in their hand when they get in front of my building, they just throw it down, go on. I'm noticing they're doing that here now. Uh, the thing is, she'd pick up, she'd bring a little basket out there and pick all the trash up. She'd sweep off the front steps. What a sweetheart that lady was. As good as she was, she had a daughter that was every bit as bad. Ain't playing no games here. Bad. Bad girl. <laughs> Instead of bad boys, bad, there's bad girls too. She was bad. And uh, while well, she'd come to church and clean up everything, wipe, wash the mirrors, I mean, she did good. And she went home on the bus and got off the bus. And when she stepped on her, you know, in Philadelphia, they all have about four, three or four steps up to your door. I don't know why that's this way. Well, they have an under uh, apartment down there. And uh, so she walked up there and put the key in. And here is a guy. His name is <laughs> James Jones, but they called him Smiley. That was a street name, Smiley, and nobody ever saw him smile. That was, I said, <laughs> I said, isn't that funny? Nobody's ever seen him smile. And when she stuck the key in and turned it, this is what they call in Philadelphia a run-up. He ran up behind her and hit her with his shoulder, and he's standing in her front room, knocked her down. Now, this girl I'm telling you about is laying over there in that front room, the television as loud as it would go watching something cartoons or something and stoned out of her head on the couch smiley was a drug dealer he's serving life right now for it and um, the thing is he said I've come for my money that girl owes me twenty thousand dollars and I either want my $20,000, my drugs, or I'm going to kill her here today, right in front of her own mother. And you know what? This lady just came out of a church service. And she stepped over there between Smiley and her daughter, and she held up her hand, and she said, You will not shoot my daughter in the name of Jesus. <laughs> he said, Well, shooting one or shooting two what difference does it make I'm going down anyway soon so he pulled out that gun and he fired at her now we're talking Philadelphia got little rooms in those 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 flats you know I mean they're 12 feet across and 15 at the at, is a big house and he shot at her and missed her he looked at the gun and shot again and missed again he shot things off the fireplace he shot pictures off the wall but he never could hit her. And he kept looking, and he'd step closer. And he couldn't hit her, and he couldn't shot at the girl and couldn't hit her either. And all it was was because she said, you'll not shoot her in the name of Jesus. Some of you don't believe what I'm saying, but some of you don't believe nothing. That's why you ain't got nothing. Do you see what I'm saying? Huh? Huh? I want you to be like me. I'm a believer. When, uh, and she didn't even tell me that. Smiley told me that. He come flying down the street, jumped up on. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to get out of, uh, you know, I'm, I'm locking up finally on Sunday evening. I'm getting ready to go home. And I'm locking up the front door of my building, the Blue Horizon. And I'm, I'm trying to lock the door. And, and uh, I'm, you know, I was going to put the key in. And I saw him coming. You could hear him. He had a big four by four. It was just roaring. You had loud pipes, everything. And I saw him, and he came down there. And Philadelphia, the sidewalk there in front of my building was like 18 feet, 20 feet wide. He jumped up on the curb. And, you know, I had a commercial building. He come flying down through there, and I thought, oh, my God, that's Smiley. And I'm trying to get the key in the door to get back in. And I couldn't get that key in that door. And I just pulled it out of the door, and I couldn't get it back in there. I'm terrified. And he comes running up there, and he said, Brother Ross, and he had a gun in his hand. He said, I just tried to kill, uh, almost had her name right there. I just tried to kill her. 
And I said, uh, why, you, why you got that gun? He said, oh, I just tried to shoot her. I said, you tried to shoot her? Why, why'd you do? And so he told me the story. He said, let's go in and I'll tell you. He left the gun with me. He said, I don't need that gun no more. You know, the truth is, child of God, if the devil tries to kill you and it ain't your time to go, I don't care if he uses a gun, a knife, a bomb, a balloon, anything, whatever it is, a water balloon, he is not going to be able to touch you because God is on your side. Rowan was her name, Louise Rowan. You and I need to know something right now, that the power of God is real in this day and time. Can I tell you right now, the devil doesn't have a gun that will shoot me. He doesn't have a knife that will cut me. He doesn't have a bomb that will blow me up. How do you like that? You think I'm afraid of the devil? The answer is no, because the devil does not have power of life and death over me. Neither does he have it over you. Jesus has the keys of death and and hell in his hands no I'm not going to die till God gets ready for me to die it's no way it's impossible and when God gets ready for me to go and I die don't you pray me back leave me alone hallelujah I don't care how much power you got with God let me go hallelujah uh, that means God's ready and I'm ready too come on say amen. amen you and I need to realize that we're serving a God who knows who you are he knows what color you like. Amen. He knows exactly you're going in and you're coming out. God knows everything about you. You say, well, why am I having such a hard time? Let me turn it around. Why are you having such a hard time? Hurts when you ask yourself that, doesn't it? Why, oh God, why am I having such a hard time? And God says, why are you having such a hard time? Listen. Jesus is not going to get re-crucified. He's not going to get whipped again. Instead, he's done it once. He entered in heaven one time, not with the blood of sheep and goats or rams. He entered in with his own blood. And he sat down at the right hand of God the Father. You need to understand that. Then he became two things. He became the minister of the sanctuary. He's my high priest forever in heaven. And he, uh, he also became my advocate. He became my lawyer up in heaven. We have an advocate with God the Father. His name is Jesus Christ. He pleads our cause. He knows about you. He knows you're rising up, you're laying down. Listen, ain't no playing with God. You can run out behind the building. You can hide from everybody, but God sees you. You can check into the seedy hotel. And God knows what your number is. He does. And today, I'm going to tell you, since God knows, what sort of men and women ought we to be? He doesn't know just bad things about you. He knows the good things he's getting ready to do. How assured in faith should you be? If you know <laughs> you're not going to stumble and fall, how would you walk? You know, I thought nothing had ever happened to me when I was a young boy down in Kentucky and I was uh, walking along uh, the edge of this big cliff with a uh, a little river down there, the Red Bird River. I'm way up on the cliff on the side of the mountain, and I'm walking along, and they and my, my aunt, Orphe, said, Ross, be careful, you could fall. I said, not me. Nothing ever bad's going to happen to me. And I stepped on some pine uh, leaves or straws, you know, them that pine stuff underneath a pine tree. And I slipped, and I sat down, and I went sliding right over that cliff. And I fell 30, 40, I don't know how high it was. It seemed like a mile. <laughs> and I sat down right in the water. And I got up, and my Aunt Orphe was yelling, Ross, are you okay? Are you okay? And I said, see, I told you nothing would happen to me. 
Amen. And the truth is, he will not suffer your foot to slip. He will not allow you to fall. He will not allow you to fail. Well, if I only had enough faith, well, the answer is, if you had the idea in your head, who do you think gave you that idea? Well, I'd start my own business, but I don't know how in the world I can do it. And God says, I don't know how in the world you can do it either. According to your faith, be it unto you. Name it and claim it. Say it and you'll have it. You want to start a business? You better get busy. Time's running out. I want you to get rich before the end comes. Amen. You and I have power with God and power with man. We have the great authority of the Holy Ghost on us. And listen. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions. And nothing by any means shall harm you. Now, why don't we believe that? You know, I've lived in a state of grace in every country that I've ever traveled to. I've been around this world three and a half, four times at least, uh, at least that many times, maybe as many as seven. I've been in countries where uh, things went wrong. I've eaten food that I didn't think was good for me. I've gone through almost everything you can think of. I lived in a state of grace. I got shot at but didn't get hit, and I didn't even duck. Amen. They threatened to kill me one night. They wanted to behead me. They wanted to cut my body up in pieces and told me that they were going to do it. Uh, they danced voodoo dances down in Haiti all night long, played drums, put spells on me. Listen now. They put the same spell on me that they put on another preacher by the name of Sam Todd. We were staying in the same hut in Boutin in Haiti. We were out there drilling a well. And he said to me, I, I heard the drums going. And, you know, I've been on a reservation out here, you know, where a lot of people think that they do nothing but witchcraft out there. I like the music. <laughs> and so I, I heard them playing the drums. So I get up and I pull that uh, hut door open. And he said, don't go out there. Those are voodoo drums. You don't know what they can put on you. And I said, they can put nothing on me. How can they? I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. I have the Holy Ghost living inside. And so I went out there. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you've, you can Google it now, uh, Haitian voodoo, and, and listen to what they sang. And they were singing, and they were dancing. They were walking barefoot through the fire and, and eating fire, coals of fire, and, and all this kind of stuff. And they have what they call a mambo, and they have a, another guy, a hungan, and uh, they were going through all of those are uh, West African words, by the way, not Creole and not Haitian. And so uh, it's bad, bad, bad stuff, they thought, till they got around to me. And since I was there and they thought they could put it all on me, I got up and started dancing with them. They didn't know what to do. I threw them into confusion. And they stood there and they put spells on me and they, they uh, took a chicken and they bit it, a white chicken and white feathers and they bit its neck and blood just flew everywhere. I got a speck of blood on my shirt. That's the only thing that upset me. But nothing happened to me. Sam Todd came back two weeks later. Sam Todd was dead of an unknown malady. They didn't know what it was. His wife called me and said, uh, uh, how, how did he die? What did he get into down there? They, he was worried about witchcraft. I'm not worried about witchcraft. Listen, anybody got any spells somebody put on you? Point right at me right now and say, I'm giving all, all to Brother Ross. Yeah. Put it all on him. The reason I'm saying that, put it all on me because it doesn't work. On, I'm Teflon. I'm the Teflon preacher. It don't stick. You and I are filled with the Holy Ghost. We have power over the devil. I believe it with my heart. I'm going to have communion here today. It's going to be a blessing to you. But if I may...